tells some world's ills on many of the same groups that Jerry Falwell blamed for 9-11, pagans, feminists, and gays. But the Shaykh saved his most venomous words for those of the Jewish faith. He spoke of interference and collusion by the United States and its Western allies to further their own agenda at the expense of Muslim nations. He used America's support for the nation of Israel to foment the emotions of his congregation. He claimed the United States persevered in its Cold War with the Soviets by using the hearts and bodies of Muslims as a military and economic strain on the USSR, and that once the Soviet Union fell, America discarded the Afghan fighters like trash on the roadside. When the blind sheikh finished his sermon, my father took my hand and led me toward the front. This wasn't the first time I'd met the sheikh. In fact, I had spent more than a few nights either at the mosque or at one of my father's friend's houses or in our own living room sitting on the floor listening to the sheikh and other men speak about religion and politics. I realized it was always somewhat ominous exchanging words with the sheikh after one of his sermons. It's looking back now that I realize even in a room full of people vying for his attention, his mind was somewhere else probably still wrapped with the passion and anger he clearly conveyed in his speech. On the drive home that afternoon, I wondered to myself, what made the sheikh and his followers so intensely devout? I asked my father, when did you become such a good Muslim? And he replied, when I came to this country and saw everything that was wrong with it. And in that instant, I recognized the same look on his face that I had seen on the sheikh. Our family dynamic began to change soon thereafter. One night at dinner when I was six years old, my father explained to me that for the past few weeks, he and some friends had been going to a shooting range for target practice. He told me I was going with him to the range the next morning. I was so eager I barely slept. My excitement once again began to mount the second we got into the car. We arrived at Calverton shooting range which unbeknownst to our group was being surveilled by the FBI. My father and I walked toward the group of men huddled by the trunk of a car. Inside were a range of weapons to choose from. When it was my turn to shoot, my father helped me hold a rifle to my shoulder and explained how to aim at the target about 30 yards off. I was so excited my palms were sweating. I closed my left eye trying to concentrate on lining up the front and rear sights with the target. I gently squeezed the trigger. My ears rang and the noise echoed through the woods. A small knot showed where the bullet struck. It was thrilling. My father seemed to be having almost as much fun as I was, if not more. Using a fully automatic weapon, he shot the legs out from under one of the larger targets. The men all shouted and had a laugh. Trying to emulate him on my next turn, I held the trigger back and the fully automatic rifle fired one bullet after another in quick succession. By the time I relaxed my finger from the trigger, I had used all of my shots. I was left with an unfulfilling feeling until I looked up and saw that most of them had found their way to the target. I walked away from the stand with my head held high, enjoying the praise I received. In fact, the only thing I wasn't enjoying was the weight. Besides the five or six men, there were just as many of their kids waiting to take their turn. By late morning, it began to softly drizzle, and I knew our time at the range was coming to an end. On what I figured would be my last turn at shooting, I took aim for my target and let each bullet fly. The last one hit the small orange light that sat on top of the target, and to everyone's surprise, especially mine, the entire target exploded black smoke billowing into the sky. My uncle turned to the rest of the men and in Arabic said, Ibn Abu, which means like father, like son. They all seemed to get a very big laugh out of that comment. It wasn't until a few years later that I fully understand, understood what they thought was so funny. They thought they saw in me the same destruction my father was capable of. Those men would eventually be found guilty of placing a van filled with 1,500 pounds of explosives into a 
the sub-level parking lot of the World Trade Center, causing an explosion that killed six people and injured over a thousand others. These were the men that I looked up to. These were the men I called Amu, which means uncle. It saddens me to think that had they not committed such a crime, they too would be at home spending time with their families. Instead, they sit in a jail cell, letting their wives and children live their lives without their guidance and companionship. I was seven years old when my father went to prison. There's not a day that goes by that I don't wish he had chosen a peaceful life with his family. Instead, he exposed me from a very young age to the intolerance and radical nature of extremism. And yet I stand before you all today with this message. That no matter the level of violence you've experienced, it doesn't have to define your character. That in all of us is the ability to change our paths. By the time I turned 19, I had already moved over 20 times in my life. That instability during my childhood didn't really provide an opportunity to make many friends. Each time I'd find one or two people I began to feel comfortable around, it was time to pack up and move to the next town. Being the perpetual new kid at school, I was frequently the target of my classmates' bullying. For the most part, I spent my childhood at home reading books and playing video games. For those reasons, my social skills were lacking, to say the least. Growing up in a bigoted household, I wasn't prepared for the real world outside. I'd been raised to judge people based on arbitrary measurements, such as a person's religion, the color of their skin, or sexual preference. A friend once asked me, if your son came up to you and said, Dad, I'm gay, what would you do? I'm ashamed to admit that I nonchalantly responded, I would beat the gay out of him. As a child, homosexuality was often described as, as a disease in need of curing or culling rather than a lifestyle. One of the major turning points in my life came when I found a summer job at an amusement park in Florida. The exposure to so many different types of people there was fundamental to the development of my character. Most importantly, it was my experience with some of the gay dancers at the park that crushed the foundation of my core beliefs. They were some of the most, some of the least judgmental, most compassionate, and open-minded individuals I ever had the pleasure of meeting. As I got to know some of them better, I began to recognize my own this epiphany, I started questioning my other beliefs. I had a discussion with my mother about how my worldview was changing. And she said something to me that I will hold dear to my heart for as long as I live. She looked at me with the weary eyes of someone who had experienced enough dogmatism to last a lifetime and said, I'm tired of hating people. It was so simple, yet so profound that I often fight back tears just thinking about it. This is the first time I've ever stood on stage and confessed to strangers the story of my life. As I mature, I realize the only way I can overcome the challenges of my past, which at times has been crippling, is to help others understand that hatred only produces more hate, but nonviolence, but rather the belief in nonviolence heals. Those cycles of violence, no matter how old, do not have to go on forever. I am not my father, and with that simple fact, I stand here as proof that violence is not inherent in one's religion or race, nor is it mandated that the son must follow the ways of his father. And should we fulfill our obligation to live peacefully, to put in the work needed in order to obtain peace, However difficult it may be, that ultimately we will leave this earth.